Okay, I think we're live. Great. So, welcome everybody. Today I'm pleased to have Arkady Garber as our speaker. Um, Arkady did his bachelor's at the University of Southern California in neuroscience. And during that time, I actually found out last night that he made a nice little video that even got a science communication video that even got second place. It's really sweet to watch. Maybe you can watch it after his talk. It's called Redshift. You will find it on YouTube. Then afterwards, he got a master's in geology at the University of Delaware. And then he became like a bioinformatician in John McCutcheon's lab, where he's doing right now a PhD. And they moved from the University of Montana to Arizona State University. But if I understood it right, you are right now in home office in Pittsburgh. And the title of your talk today is Evolution of Interdependence in a Four-Way Mealybug Symbiosis. So I give you the word now and you myself. Happy to have you here. Thanks, Leticia. Uh, and and thanks, to, thank, thanks to the organizers for putting together the seminar and for Leticia to hosting my talk. Uh, and this is really great. Um, my name is Arkady Garber. I'm an incoming grad student at Arizona State University in John McCutcheon's lab. So I've been working with John for almost uh, two years now at the University of Montana. And this summer, uh, the McCutcheon lab is moving to Arizona State University where I'll be transitioning into a microbiology uh, PhD program. Uh, so today I'll be talking about some of our work looking into early genomic adaptations uh, in bacterial endosymbionts. So our model organism is the, the mealybug pictured uh, here on this uh, very old and gross looking potato. So uh, the mealybugs here are these uh, white specks. Hopefully you can see them. Some of them are out of focus. Uh, some of them are somewhat in focus. You can see that they're sort of uh, various points around this potato. So we use potatoes um, to culture mealybugs, which feed on a, uh, a nutrient on um, nutrient poor plant sap. So this diet, this nutrient poor diet is what requires mealybugs to maintain bacterial endosymbionts, which supplement the host diet with a variety of essential amino acids and, and also vitamins. So mealybugs are a great model organism to study evolution of intracellular symbionts. Uh, and there are a lot of other examples of intracellular symbioses and blood and sap sucking bugs that help us understand microbe host interactions and evolution. Uh, so insects are really good models for studying evolution of symbioses because there are a lot of diverse examples of, of these types of symbioses. There's a great variety of insects that have very different diets and recruit a diverse array of bacterial symbionts. And, and these really help us to understand host microbe interactions and the early development and evolution of these intracellular symbionts. So mealybugs, which are the focus of my research, uh, also present a diverse set of species which have a variety of intracellular symbiotic partners, uh, some of which are very ancient associations. So in really ancient symbioses, uh, we consider uh, symbionts organelles. So the two examples of this are the mitochondrion and the chloroplast. So the intracellular symbionts that led to the evolution of these organelles are perhaps the most significant developments in the evolution of eukarya the eukaryotic domain of life. So these are essentially the gold st standards for really old uh, intracellular symbioses. So, so there's a variety of theories on exactly how these and the symbiotic events happened. But the general idea is that uh, at some point, a, a, proto a prokaryotic or a proto-eukaryotic host cell engulfed uh, an alpha proteobacterium. And this turned into a symbiotic relationship where the alpha proteobacteria permanently resides in the host. And it's passed on vertically from 
from mother to daughter cell. Uh, so after a very long time, this evolved into what we know today as the mitochondria. Uh, similarly with chloroplasts, engulfment of a cyanobacterium resulted in what we know today as the chloroplast. So given that these are very old symbioses, there's a lot that we don't know about the early days of these microbial uh, relationships. So to understand how these symbioses form in the early days of adaptations that occur in the host and the intracellular symbiont, we can, we can look at examples of more recently developed uh, symbioses. Uh, so this is where the mealybugs come in. So in the McCutcheon lab, one of the mealybug species that's at the center of research is uh, this mealybug, the citrus mealybug called Planococcus citri, uh, which maintains multiple proteobacterial and the symbionts. Uh, and the spatial organization uh, of end of symbionts in, in these mealybugs is striking. So inside specialized cells called bacteriocytes, one bacteriocyte is pictured here, uh, they retain beta proteobacterial endosymbionts, which are these large sac-like cells, uh, pictured blue here. Uh, and inside Tremblaya, you'll see these uh, red blobs, and these are actually gamma proteobacteria that reside inside of Tremblaya. Uh, and while Tremblaya are uh, relatively big compared to most, uh, compared to other bacteria, these uh, intra tremblaya gamma proteobacteria, which are known as Morinella uh, or Candidatus Morinella and Dobia, I'll refer to them as Morinella throughout this talk, they have a more typical size and, and the classical rod shape that bacteria have. So we can think of this spatial organization as similar to the Russian nested dolls or Matryoshkas. See where you have the insect cell. Then inside of that is the uh, beta proteobacterial symbiont Tremblaya. And inside of Tremblaya reside uh, the gamma proteobacteria Morinella. So you might be thinking to yourself, why on earth uh, is this like this? And uh, does this symbiosis actually work? And if so, how does it work? So it looks like it works pretty well. As I mentioned before, mealybugs maintain nutritional symbionts, which provide essential amino acids and vitamins that are low in concentrations in the mealybug's uh, diet of plants have. Uh, so in the case of uh, the mealybug Panococcus seed tree uh, and its symbionts Morinella and Tremblaya, we see that the biosynthetic pathways for certain essential amino acids uh, and vitamins is broken up among each respective genome. So shown here is one of numerous examples where we can see that neither the host nor each separate symbiont ha actually has the full repertoire of genes to synthesize a metabolite. Two metabolites shown here is tryptophan and phenylalanine. So these are actually amino acids. Uh, so instead, the genomes really complement each other and they, they work together to generate this metabolite. You can see here that uh, a collection of genes that are required for the synthesis of charismate here, which is a precursor to both tryptophan and phenylalanine. And you can see that uh, part of the pathway is encoded by genes on the Tremblaya genome, and other parts encoded by genes on the Morinella genome, and there's other parts that are encoded on the host genome. So to make things even more complicated, the insect host genome also encodes bacterial genes that have been acquired horizontally from other bacteria. Uh, we have cases where certain pathway components appear to be missing from both symbionts, and they're actually supplemented by genes that are encoded uh, by the host. Uh, here pictured yellow, brown, and orange. Uh, and, and we can see that in the synthesis of lysine, uh, two horizontally acquired genes on the insect genome actually participate in that synthesis. And we also see the same case in peptidoglycan. So, one of the ongoing questions in, in our lab is how bacterial genes encoded on the host actually function in the end of symbionts. Uh, and how are the protein products transported uh, through the many membranes separating the host cytoplasm and the, the innermost uh, symbiont cytoplasm. So in some cases, like the in the cases of essential amino acids, it seems possible that metabolites are transported between cellular compartments but 
that would be more difficult in the case of peptidoglycan synthesis. Uh, for peptidoglycan or cell wall synthesis, we know that the metabolic precursors are synthesized and constructed in the cytoplasm and periplasm of the innermost bacterial symbiont. And many of the required genes are encoded only on the insect genome as horizontal gene transfers or HDTs. So the protein products must somehow be transported through the membranes of Tremblaya, uh, the outer symbiont, and then cross through uh, the inner and outer membranes of Mornella. So this may sound like an overly complicated and elaborate way of doing things, but we know it works, at least for peptidoglycan synthesis. Uh, and this confocal image shows uh, fluorescently labeled uh, D-alanine. So for those that remember organic, the organic chemistry, amino acids used in protein, protein sequences are all exclusively L enantiomers or left-handed stereoisomers of each amino acid. But in the case of the bacterial cell wall, the D enantiomer of alanine is used, D alanine. And this property of cell walls is commonly used in studies to probe the dynamics and, and mechanics of, of the, how the cell wall is synthesized in bacteria. And we're able to use this property to show enrichment of D alanine at the periphery of Morinella cells, here pictured green, uh, confirming that cell wall is indeed synthesized uh, in Morinella. So in this, in this image uh, uh, from a recent publication out of McCutcheon lab uh, shows that the nuclei are colored blue and you could see uh, bacteria, separate bactericides here, here, and the Morinella cells are clustered together uh, in a way that re represents a tremblia cell. So this would be one cell tremblia, this would be another tremblia, that would be another tremblia, and they're just filled with these gamma pretty bacteria. <clears throat> uh, so now I wanna move on to a different species of mealybug, the one at the center of my research. And that one is called Pseudococcus longispinus. So while this mealybug also maintains Tremblia, uh, the, the beta proteobacterial and the symbiont whose genome is near identical to the genome of Tremblia in Planococcus sea tree, uh, what's going on inside of Tremblia in this species of mealybug is a different story. So rather than one, it encodes two different species of gamma proteobacterial endosymbionts. Uh, so given the elaborate genomic complementarity that we see in uh, Planococcus sea tree with only two bacterial symbionts, one inside the other, we wanted to find out how the symbiosis works when we have three different species of symbionts in the, in the mealybug. Uh, so we know that the PC tree mealybug has one gamma, and we know that each tremblia cell, uh, pictured here in green in this uh, cartoon, uh, that each tremblia cell is filled with these Morinella cells, these gamma proteobacteria. Uh, but when the genomes of the two gamma proteobacteria that uh, reside inside tremblia in P. longispinus were sequenced and reported in 2016 by uh, Philip Husnick and, and John McCutcheon, it was really unclear where these uh, two symbionts resided within each insect cell. So to answer this question, we probed the insect cells containing these symbionts with different probes specific to each gamma proteobacterial symbiont. So in this RNA fish image here on the left, uh, which was uh, taken by my lab mate, Maria Cooper, we can visualize the two species of gamma proteobacteria that live inside Tremblia. Uh, and, and the two probes used here are, are yellow and violet. So yellow for, uh, uh, actually the image got cut off here for some reason, but uh, yellow color was used to identify one of the other symbionts known as PLON1 and violet, the violet color was used for the other uh, species of gamma proteobacteria. Uh, and the green in this image represents uh, tremblia cells with nuclei, with insect nuclei colored white. <clears throat> so um, we can see from this uh, fish image that both species of gamma proteobacteria reside within each tremblia cell. 
So we decided to name these endosymbionts uh, and we named them uh, one of the endosymbionts, Candidatus Symbiopectobacterium endolongospinus, uh, which represents, uh, the genus name represents its closest free living ancestor, which happens to be Pectobacterium wasabiae. And the other gamma proteobacterial symbiont uh, we named Candidatus sedalis endolongospinus. So that also represents the closest free living ancestor uh, relative to um, that symbiont, which is Sodalis precaptivus. Uh, but for simplicity, I'll refer to these uh, symbionts throughout this presentation as PLON1 and PLON2. Uh, so the genomes of PLON1 and PLON2 uh, looks appear to be large in size, comparable, comparable to the sizes of uh, free living bacteria. Uh, and, and they're outlined here in green, along with Tremblaya, which has a tiny genome. Um, and Mornella also has a tiny genome. So if you'll remember that one of the mealybug species here, the C tree that I talked about first is outlined in blue and it has uh, Tremblaya with inside of which reside Mornella and then Pseudococcus longospinus, we have Tremblaya inside of which reside PLON1 and PLON2. So the differences in genome size here are pretty, pretty stark, I'd say. And, uh, and one question that we can ask is how does a genome go from looking from being this big PLON1 size genome, which is almost five megabase pairs to something that's as tiny as 400 kilobase pairs. So to understand that uh, we can look to an established model for genomic reduction that appears to occur when the bacterium enter, enters an intracellular uh, symbiotic lifestyle. So the genomes of free living bacteria tend to be uh, gene dense. Uh, so this large uh, circle here represents a genome of a free living bacteria. So they're gene dense. Uh, they tend to have very few pseudogenes. So pseudogenes, which I'll talk uh, more at length later on, uh, they're remnants of what were once intact and functional genes, but appear to have become inactivated in some way. So these can form if an organism undergoes some kind of ecological shift and no longer requires that gene for survival, or uh, another example is a gene might undergo duplication and one of the copies would be unnecessary and could undergo a brief period of, of as a pseudogene before being deleted. Uh, but in free living organisms, uh, pseudogenes aren't really known to hang around for very long and they're quickly purged out of the genome once they're formed. Uh, and then the genome sizes of bacteria tends to a rate, tends to range no more than an order of magnitude. So they're generally one to 10 megabase pairs in size. Uh, so upon host restriction though, we see very fast and extreme genomic dilapidation where relaxed selection of genes that aren't required anymore in an in intracellular lifestyle, they become pseudogenes. Uh, insertion sequences, transposases proliferate and deletions of large parts of the genome lead quickly to middle age uh, where the process slows down, but we still see a formation of pseudogenes and uh, genomic reduction. So by the time a genome's the size of a Morinella or a Tremblaya, we don't really see a lot of pseudogenes in the genome. And the genome itself appears very small, but it's streamlined again with uh, very small intergenic regions. So it has not a lot of genes, but it's gene dense because the genome size is very small. So we have quite a few examples of these ancient symbionts. Um, their genomes are represented here as these circles on the right. Uh, Tremblia princeps here is, is shown as 140 kilobase pairs. Uh, and there's other examples like Candidata zendaria and Tecticola, which has a 208,000 base pair genome. Uh, so we have quite a few examples of these ancient symbionts and where there are small population sizes and frequent bottlenecks that occur during vertical transmission result in accelerated evolution. And this is why we see that they have extremely long branch lengths relative to the rest of the bacteria in this uh, this tree. So I'd like to now rewind the clock back to the turbulent beginnings of these symbioses and the genomic adaptations that occur at their dawn. 
So to understand the early adaptations and recently acquired symbionts, we and, and also understand how this complicated four-way symbiosis works and, and mealybugs, we undertook a comprehensive analysis of PLON1 and PLON2's genome with respect to the genome disruption that has occurred since they've entered a host-restricted lifestyle. So since the genomes of PLON1 and PLON2 are large, uh, com com comparable to the sizes of free-living bacteria, they appear to be very recent acquisitions to a host-restricted lifestyle. So consistent with the, with the model for genomic reduction that I, that I referenced earlier on, they're already showing signs of extreme genomic disruption. They have many pseudogenes on the order of thousands of pseudogenes and extremely low coding densities. Uh, you can see that compared to free-living uh, relatives, Sodalus captivus and Pectobacterium wasabi, which have uh, genome sizes that are comparable in size, although a little bit bigger, uh, but they also have coding densities that are much higher and pseudogene counts that are much lower. Uh, so we can also visualize this steep loss in coding density in comparison to free-living bacteria, uh, which typically have uh, uh, a one-to-one -one ratio of genes to genome size in kilobase pairs. Uh, in the endosymbionts, we generally see that the genome size is still large, but the number of intact genes has dropped steeply. So here, the y-axis shows number of intact genes and the genome size is on the y-axis. But as the unnecessary regions of the genome are deleted over time, the genomes move um, toward a more streamlined version here, approaching a gene density that's more in line with, with the one that we see in free-living bacteria here. Uh, so based on our analysis of PLON1 and PLON2 genomes, we see a variety of different disruptions to genes. And, and given the level of decay that we see in these genomes, which are just riddled with disrupted genes and deletions, uh, it's actually difficult to get a sense of which genes are actually intact and appear to be functional. But before mentioning these disruptions in detail and how, and how we classify them, I just wanted to do a quick reminder on, on the ex expected, uh, expected architecture of bacterial genes and their, and their uh, regulatory sequences. Uh, so, so they typically follow this format of a promoter, a ribosomal binding site, a start codon, followed by uh, a, fr a frame. So the nucleotides are organized in triplet codons, each codon coding for an amino acid. And if there's an operon, then we would see more uh, genes downstream. So uh, this stands for downstream open reading frames. Um, so if there are mutations in the promoter or the ribosomal binding site or the start codon, which could be you know, results in an alternate start codon, or it could just, you know, you could have a mutation that removes the start codon. That would result in an activation of transcription or translation of a gene. That's because the promoter um, is required for the transcription of a, of a generation of a transcript, of an mRNA, an mRNA transcript, while the ribosomal binding site allows that transcript to bind to the ribosome for translation. Uh, so if there's mutations to any of these parts of the gene, then transcription or translation would be affected. Uh, but we also see other things that occur within the gene itself. So we see premature stop codons, which would be caused by stop mutation that uh, changes something that could be a, a codon like a TAT to a TAG. And that results in the premature stop codon resulting in the fragmented gene and that could potentially result in a truncated and misfolded uh, protein product if it's translated. Uh, we also could have insertions or deletions that may result in a frame shift that could also have deleterious effects. One example shown here is an insertion that results in a premature stop codon uh, that uh, comes into frame. And, and this is in addition to the fact that with the wrong frame, uh, the synthesized protein would not contain the right amino acids and likely result in misfolded and potentially toxic protein product. Uh, another example shown here is that an indel or an insertion or deletion can result in a frame shift that actually takes a stop codon uh, out of frame. 
So it would have been a stop codon, could be uh, a, a CGT, AGT, uh, and so on. And that could result in the run on a uh, protein product or a, a protein that's a lot longer uh, than the expected gene would be. So to better understand and quantify the metabolic and biosynthetic capacity of the young and the symbionts, PLAN1 and PLAN2, we've been collaborating with uh, Philip Husnick and, and Mitch Seiberg also on the software to provide us with an accurate accounting of all potential pseudogenes. So the software called um, PseudoFinder, uh, which is uh, freely available currently on Philip's uh, GitHub page, so the software takes into account various metrics, uh, including the length of the gene relative to its uh, closest relatives, uh, length of the gene relative to homologs and free living relatives. Uh, it also identifies genes that have been fragmented by one or more stop mutations or premature stop codons uh, or a frame shift. Another important contribution of the software is the identification of uh, incipient or cryptic pseudogenes. So these are genes that lack any obvious inactivating mutation, but they nonetheless appear to be undergoing relaxed selection. So, so this is done by calculating the rate of synonymous mutations per synonymous site and comparing that to the result in, to the uh, rate of non-synonymous mutations per non-synonymous site. Uh, so synonymous mutations, uh, for those unfamiliar, refer to those uh, mutations that don't result in the change in amino acid sequence. That's because of the degeneracy of the of the um, uh, of codons. You could have several codons coding for one amino acid. So there are cases where a mutation in a nucleotide sequence would not actually result in any change in the amino acid sequence. So these synonymous mutations are essentially a measure of divergence time between two sequences. Uh, divergence that occurs due to random mutations that shouldn't have any effect on fitness because they don't change the amino acid sequence. Uh, and they don't change the sequence of the protein. And non-synonymous mutations here calculated as DN refer to those that results that do result in the change in the, of amino acid. So that means you have a some kind of point mutation in a nucleotide sequence, and that point mutation changes the codon, which and has a code for a different amino acid. So more, the more of these non-synonymous mutations you have in the gene, the less conserved uh, the protein sequence is. So by comparing these two ratios, uh, synonymous mutation rate and non-synonymous mutation rate, we can infer whether a gene is undergoing purifying, neutral, or adaptive selection. Uh, or positive selection. So in practice, we can actually combine all these uh, metrics that I talked about in the last slide to pr improve our pseudogene predictability. So we can actually visualize the genomic dilapidation that occurs in one of the young and the symbionts that I've chosen, for example, PLON2. And here on the x-axis, uh, we see the length of this of symbiont gene in comparison to the length of a homolog and its closest free living relative. So in that case it would be Sedalis precaptivus. Uh, so we see that there are quite a few genes that are substantially shorter than their homologs in Sedalis and some that are longer. On the y-axis, we can visualize the sequence conservation based on uh, DNDS. Uh, and also another, another metric that's displayed here is uh, whether or not a gene has accumulated some kind of premature stop codon. So filled circles uh, represent genes that don't appear to have acquired any premature stop codon. And the open circles uh, are those that appear in multiple fragments. So thus have uh, acquired at least one stop mutation or frame shift resulting in a premature stop codon. And so this is color coded to show flag pseudogenes, which are colored red. And, and you, can, you can see that any gene that has a premature stop codon is actually automatically flagged as a pseudogene. So we, we wouldn't expect to see any uh, open circles that are black. So uh, as you can see here, there's a lot of pseudogenes. Uh, 
Uh, another interesting observation that we've made from this data is that out of the thousands of putative pseudogenes that we flagged here, uh, there's only a relatively small handful that appear to have uh, really elevated DNDS values or that appear to be, uh, that have been around as pseudogenes long enough to have acquired enough mutations to have a detectable signal of neutral uh, selection. So we can visualize that, that particular observation better in a plot where the rate of non-synonymous mutations per non-synonymous site is shown on the y-axis and uh, the rate of synonymous mutations per synonymous site is shown on the x-axis. Um, so the average DNDS of all genes is uh, displayed here by this uh, dotted orange line. So the average DNDS is actually 0.1, which is really low, uh, fairly low. And the blue line indicates a DNDS ratio of 0.3. So this is uh, a cutoff that we use to flag pseudogenes. So theoretically, we expect that pseudogenes that are no longer required for survival in the host restricted environment should no longer be conserved and undergo neutral evolution. Uh, however, most of the pseudogenes uh, have DNDS values that are still really low uh, in line with, with the average, supporting the idea that uh, most of the pseudogenes actually formed relatively recently. And it also suggests that pseudogenes, once they're formed, they don't really stick around very long, even in these end of symbionts, and they're likely removed from the genome quickly upon formation. But in, in this plot, we can also see, uh, I've pointed out some genes that have been pseudogenes and have been pseudogenes long enough to have acquired enough uh, non-synonymous mutations uh, that we can infer that they're undergoing neutral evolution. And um, interestingly, we see that a lot of the genes here are hypotheticals, so they're no longer recognizable or they're able to be annotated. We also see some genes that are involved in uh, the synthesis of flagellar, flagellum, uh, which makes sense because these endosymbionts don't really need to be swimming to a lot of places once they're in an intracellular uh, environment. Uh, so now that we have a better idea of what the genomes of PLON1 and PLON2 look like in terms of intact genes, I, I want to get back to this idea of pathway, biosynthetic pathway complementarity. So if you remember from earlier in, in my talk, I mentioned that in the three-way symbiosis in the Mealybug PC tree, we have biosynthetic pathways that are partitioned uh, between three genomes involved. So here we have Tremblia, Mornella, and the host. Uh, but what does this look like in Pseudococcus longus finus, where we have a four-way symbiosis? So well, in the synthesis of amino acids, we already see complementarity, complementary gene loss indicating uh, quickly developing division of labor between the, between the three symbionts and the host. So even, even though PLON1 and PLON2 are both very recently acquired in the symbionts, we already see substantial gene loss in the synthesis of uh, certain essential amino acids. And these pathways are complemented by Tremblia and the host. <clears throat> Some more pathway examples are shown here, where we see that host acquired, um, horizontally acquired uh, genes on the host genome uh, participate in the biosynthesis of amino acids. This is also seen in the biosynthesis of biotin, which is a required cofactor uh, for these bacteria and the host. In, in this case, host encoded uh, HGTs or bacterial horizontally acquired genes may have taken over and resulted in the loss of pathway components in the endosymbionts. Uh, as you can see here, both PLON1 and PLON2, which are colored red and orange, uh, have actually lost, for example, all of these genes. Uh, in some cases, like the one seen here for BioC, the gene appears to be completely missing from the system. And uh, we don't know yet whether this pathway can operate without this gene or whether there's another moonlighting host protein that can fill this role. Uh, 
but we do know that this is a consistent pattern uh, that we see where certain pathway components are missing like this uh, from a variety of biosynthetic pathways. Uh, in the case of peptidoglycan biosynthesis, uh, we see loss of certain components, but overall the pathway, the pathways in PLON1 and PLON2 appear to be, uh, appear to be still there. Uh, but we still see loss of certain components, and we've been able to verify that the cell wall is indeed synthesized by PLON1 and PLON2, even with some of these missing components. And, and this confirmation was done using a similar approach as the one that was done in uh, PC tree uh, using labeled D-alanine. Uh, in this circle, I just pointed out one uh, insect cell. It's a bactericide. And in this inner circle will be a uh, tremblaya. And inside tremblaya, you see the strong green signal uh, indicating presence of the alanine at the periphery of these gamma periphery bacteria. Uh, so we haven't figured out yet how to differentially label both the gamma periphery bacteria and the symbionts, but given the density of, of the signal here, peptidoglycan signal coming from inside tremblaya, it looks like both PLON1 and PLON2 are able to synthesize peptidoglycan. <clears throat> okay, so now when we look at central metabolism pathways, we actually see a lot more conservation. Uh, here I, I show glycolysis, the acetate node, and the pentose phosphate pathway. So this strong conservation of central metabolism pathways makes sense because these pathways represent a source of NADH, ATP, and other metabolic precursors of not only amino acids and vitamins, but also of cellul cellular hardware like membranes and peptidoglycan. Uh, in addition to the central metabolism components, we also see conservation of the membrane-bound electron carriers that pump protons and maintain a proton motor force. Uh, and we see this con this conserved not only in the in the young and the symbionts PLON1 and PLON2, we also see this in other uh, older symbionts uh, that reside in mealybugs. So we see this NADH dehydrogenase is conserved. We see the conservation of this terminal oxygen reductase, but we see that ATP synthase components in PLON1 and PLON2 are uh, starting to become pseudogenized. And if you look at the examples of older endosymbionts, like Morinella, for example, uh, we see that ATP synthase is long gone. And, and this is interesting because why would the endosymbionts maintain the proton motor force and not use it to make ATP? So what we think is going on is that the proton motor force is conserved for the various transporters that are encoded by these symbionts that allow them to transport various metabolites and even proteins. So the substrate is also fueled by uh, substrate level generation of NADH, which would provide reducing equivalence to the NADH dehydrogenase. Uh, and given that these symbionts don't appear to encode, uh, they appear to lose the ATP synthase and they don't look like they encode the ATP, ADP translocases. Um, we think that the main source of ATP is uh, substrate level phosphorylation and they do retain uh, genes that result in the formation of ATP via substrate level phosphorylation. Uh, and these central metabolism components that result in substrate level generation of ATP and, AD and NADH are retained in PLON1 and PLON2 as intact genes. And they are all, they appear to be present in older and the symbionts like Morinella. So to summarize the last few slides, central metabolism conservation is important to generate various metabolic precursors, NADH and ATP production, which help to fuel transport of various substrates between the symbiotic members. Amino acid biosynthesis pathways might be easier to break up between the symbiotic partners because amino acids are relatively small metabolites and could potentially be easily transported between the cellul cellular compartments. And peptidoglycan appears to hold that longer, but based on examples of older symbionts like Mortonella from, from Planococcus C. tree mealybugs, we know that 
that peptoglycan synthesis pathway is also eventually broken down and the division of labor is partitioned. So how are things actually shuttled around in this complicated mess? So uh, this is a transmission electron microscopy image of a, of a bacteriocyte of an insect cell from Pseudococcus longus finus uh, taken by Martha Ladinsky over at Caltech. So here we see the nucleus in the middle and we see these light gray blobs as tremblia. And within that, we see these dark uh, electron dense uh, dots as the PLON1 and PLON2 gamma pretty bacteria. So how does that work? So for example, in the biosynthesis of peptidoglycan, we know that proteins need to be transported all the way from the host cytoplasm, the insect cell cytoplasm, and through tremblia and inside of the gamma proteobacteria into the cytoplasm of the gamma proteobacteria. So to briefly bring back this figure from a paper that came out of the McCutcheon lab last year, uh, Boblitz et al. Uh, in cell, we can see that peptidoglycan is made and actually appears to be carried out uh, in part by proteins that have been transported from the insect cytoplasm. Uh, and the presence of host encoded uh, horizontally acquired genes in mo within Morinella cytoplasm was actually confirmed by staining one of these proteins, MUR-F, with an antibody. Here in this confocal image from that same uh, paper, we can see that, you can see clearly that the insect cell, uh, here a bacteriocyte containing tremblia cells uh, inside of which were Morinella, we can see that it contains the red colored MUR-F antibody stain. And the nucleus here is stained blue. So what's unclear is yet is whether MUREF, the MUREF protein is itself transported into the insect cytoplasm through tremblia or whether the mRNA transcript for MUREF is transported and then translated inside of Morinella. So one clue to this question comes from signal P analysis of MUREF, uh, the MUREF gene that's encoded on the insect cell genome as an HDT. So we use SignalP to analyze MUREF as well as some of the other insect encoded HDTs. And SignalP predicts the presence of a signal peptide that may target the protein to the endoplasmic reticulum, the ER. Uh, so this graph from SignalP shows the probability score for the presence of a signal peptide within the first 20 or so N-terminal amino acids within the MUREF sequence. And the cleavage side here as the dotted green line spikes at around the spot where the signal sequence uh, probability drops, which makes sense because if you have a signal sequence here, you want that to be cleaved from the mature protein. Uh, and, and this refers to the fact that neither the signal sequence or cleavage site was identified in this part of the protein, which, would, uh, which should be the part of the mature protein. So with that small clue, I wanted to start constructing a, a rough model of the transport network that might be occurring in this complex four-way symbiosis. So keeping in mind that this, this model represents a very tenuous hypothesis on how the transport network inside the mealybugs uh, operates. So in this schematic, I have the one insect cell, the bacteriocyte pictured with tremblia colored blue inside of that. And inside of tremblia, we have PLON1, with its outer and inner membranes and PLON2 with its outer and inner membranes. So if the signal sequence on, on the uh, MUR-F, for example, can target proteins to the ER, which can then interact with tremblia, that might actually provide a route for proteins to get into tremblia. Uh, now, once the proteins are inside tremblia, they will still need to cross two membranes to get inside the cytoplasm uh, of the gamma, gamma proteobacteria. So we don't really know how this occurs. There's many unknowns on, as to how this happens, but we know that the tremblia genome, uh, small as it is, does appear to retain some protein chaperones. Uh, the gamma, protea, gamma proteobacterial endosymbionts appear to retain at least one outer membrane porin, uh, which may allow for transport of proteins through the outer membrane. And the gamma proteobacterial endosymbionts also appear to retain uh, certain uh, components of the SEC protein translocation pathway. 
but this pathway is known to allow for protein excretion from the cytoplasm to the periplasm of bacterial cells, not the other way around, as would need to happen in this case. So, so this question as to how exactly transport occurs here is an open question in, in, in our lab. So to summarize, uh, on, on, to, to end on that little mystery or cliffhanger, I'd like to end my talk and go over some of the main conclusions that, that I've gone over. So the mealybug Pseudococcus longus pinus retain tremblia, inside of which exist not one, but two different species of gamma proteobacteria uh, called PLON1 and PLON2. Uh, PLON1 and PLON2 genomes are both relatively large and encode many pseudogenes indicating that they've very recently been uh, introduced into a uh, intracellular and the symbiotic lifestyle. This four-way symbiosis, uh, and when I say four-way, I mean four-way between PLON1, PLON2, Tremblaya, and the host, uh, it's already showing division of labor and complementarity in gene loss uh, in the two recently acquired in the symbionts. Central metabolism and peptidoglycan biosynthesis pathway are retained longer than amino acid and vitamin biosynthesis pathways. And extensive sharing of protein products and metabolites uh, likely necessitates complex transport networks. And uh, looking at the genomes of PLON1 and PLON2, as well as, well, as well as the older gamma proteobacterial and the symbionts like Morinella, we can see that the, and the symbionts appear to retain a, a small number, a limited number of transport proteins, uh, but it's still unclear exactly how this system operates. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, my advisor, John McCutcheon, uh, my office mate, Maria Cooper, who did the rRNA fish imaging and has provided many useful insights, uh, as well as doing the hard work of actually culturing the mealybugs. Uh, thanks to Deanna Boblitz for doing a lot of the microscopy presented here, uh, including the click chemistry images and also culturing the mealybugs, uh, Stephanie Walden for doing the culturing and sequencing, and also thanks to Diane Brooks and Piotr Lukasik for many insightful discussions. Uh, it's also been great to collaborate with Philip Husnick and, and Mitch uh, Cyber Golson on PseudoFinder and try to figure out exactly how we can identify pseudogenes. Um, and with that, I will uh, take questions. Okay, congratulations on this really interesting talk. Thank it's really you. exciting. I have first one uh, question about understanding. Maybe I was just too excited to have you here that I, I think I missed that in the beginning. So are these three bacterial players, are they transmitted uh, vertically? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. So let's move on to some of the questions um, in the YouTube channel. So Roland Hudson Pickler wants to know, um, he thinks it's a very interesting talk. I'm wondering whether you see an increase in transporters. They clearly need to exchange a lot of more metabolites. It could be a good model system to characterize new transporters. Oh yeah. It's actually a really great uh, question and comment. Um, I think that, uh, it's interesting to look at uh, some of the transporters that appear to be uh, flagged as pseudogenes. So for example, the, the SEC translocation pathway, one of the things I've noticed is that it, it, they're flagged as pseudogenes because uh, some of the components of the SEC pathway are flagged as pseudogenes because they have high DNDS uh, ratio. So they appear to be, uh, uh, they appear to be uh, changing in some way. So if you do follow genetic tree, you'll see that the, some of the components actually are more are branch out. So one of the interesting things that I've want, been wanting to look at is to see whether or not these components could be altered in some way to allow for, uh, for the transport of proteins in the other direction. Uh, but yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good comment, good, good question. Then I have a question from Catherine Armbruster, and she's asking, for the pseudogenes that are fragments of one original gene, did different fragments of the same original gene have different DNDS values? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, they tend to be similar when we, when we compare them. So if you have 
uh, if I understand the question correctly, if you have uh, two fragments of a gene and they're both compared to the, so the way we identify uh, that is if we have um, two uh, adjacent uh, open reading frames that appear to be uh, closely related to one open reading frame uh, in a relative, in the free living relative, and they're adjacent, and when you combine them, they're actually equal to the length of the homolog, then we've categorized that as a fragmented gene, as a fragmented order. And then when we calculate the DNDS ratio of DNDS values in comparison of each fragment to that relative, that DNDS would be more or less the same. But uh, the caveat to that is I haven't uh, manually looked at all of the, uh, all of the ratios. Um, that would be good to do to see if there's any uh, differences like that. But we do have uh, thousands of pseudogenes and, and hundreds of fragmented ores. So it, it, it takes some time to, to, to look into that. That's yeah. a good question. Then we have a comment from Daniel Tamarit. Um, fascinating stuff, Arkady. Any chance that any of the partially pseudogenized pathways follow similar complementarity patterns as other in the symbiotic consortia? Or do they rather seem 100% random? Hmm. That's a, that's a good question. I think that uh, in, I don't know, actually, I think that in, in so if, if, is the, what's the, if I understand correctly, you're, it's asking if the same, if the pathways are fragmented in the same way, or if they are, if the same pathways are fragment are broken up. It seems if it's if they follow some kind of pattern, or if, if you see it's just basically random. I think that in the case of the mealy bugs, which in, uh, in which the host encodes uh, horizontally acquired genes from bacteria, the loss appears to be in a way where if a gene is present on the insect genome as a horizontally acquired gene from other bacteria, then the endosymbiont is free to lose that uh, gene. But if you have another example of an intracellular symbiont where that's not the case and you don't have the gene that could be supplemented by the host, then we wouldn't expect to see that loss. So the pattern would be different. So the pattern would depend on the actual uh, overall host environment and how well it's primed for uh, an endosymbiont. But in the in the case of the two the two mealybug species that I talked about, Planococcus citri and Pseudococcus longus pinus, those are actually sister species of mealybug. So we do see a lot of the similar uh, HDTs on both insect genomes. So we do expect to see the same pattern of gene loss because uh, we have so we have this the this uh, similar HDTs on the insect genome, and we have a Tremblia, which whose genome is essentially the same between the two uh, mealybug species. So the, in that case, the pattern would be the same, but as you move to a different system and you have a you know, different overall environment, then I wouldn't expect to see the same, uh, the same uh, gene loss, the same fragmentation of pathways. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, it makes sense. Then we have a comment from Dan Spith and he says, cool stuff. I might have missed you say it, but is the increased length of some non pseudogenized genes expected or meaningful? Um, or can you repeat that question? Is the yes, longer, than expect, longer than expected length of non pseudogenes? So if the increased length of some of the non pseudogenized genes, if this is expected? Um, I don't know. I think that uh, to a certain degree, perhaps, uh, but in a lot of the cases that I've looked at where we see that the endosymbiont gene is substantially longer, like let's say 25% longer than its closest homologue in the free living relative, uh, then uh, if, you look at, if you look at that sequence, you actually see if there could be a frame shift that takes a stop code and out of frame. And then that gene eventually, you know, by random chance, encounters a stop codon. So when you run a program like Prodigal and you try to predict these genes, Prodigal is gonna uh, have some problems with that and it's gonna look for a stop codon. And if that stop codon appears to be, uh, appears to make the gene substantially longer, uh, that would 
I guess that would be a pseudogene, but uh, does, that, does that sort of answer the question? I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I was also wondering from your um, plot about the DNDS ratios, you assumed that if the DNDS ratios are really low, then um, the gene is under some kind of purifying selection. And then mm -hmm. as it as it gets bigger and reaches zero, it's neutral selection. But I don't remember from your plot, did you have any genes that were under positive selection? As, as they gets, go up high. As, yeah, as it gets bigger and approaches uh, a DNDS ratio of one. Yeah, so we, we infer. Um, but yeah, so, so your question is whether or not we have any genes with DNDS ratios high enough where we can uh, confidently infer that they're adaptively evolving to a host yeah. environment. Yeah. We have a few, I haven't looked at those yet, uh, but we have a few of the genes whose DNDS ratio is above one, but I, I'd like to do some more uh, more testing in PAML to, to figure out whether or not they're actually, uh, you know, adaptively evolving or whether it's still neutral evolution. Yeah, or might be still something yet. with the alignment or something. Yeah. Okay, I think these were all the questions so far. People are just commenting that it was a really interesting talk and they're thanking you. <laughs> mm. Well, yeah, well, thanks for, uh, thanks for attending. Hopefully um, uh, I answered everybody's questions uh, <laughs> um, fairly. Uh, if, you, if there's more questions, feel free to, uh, I don't know where they would uh, comment that or send that. Is there, is the YouTube video that's uploaded is that allow comments or yes so they can also comment openly okay great yeah talk. sometimes we have comments in coming in a little bit later yeah because some of the some of the comments like dan, dan Speth, i'd like to maybe think about a little longer because it's it's yeah. hard for to, to process all that so i'd, I'd like to <laughs> have it in writing and look at it and think about it and then i could give a, a much better thoughtful answer yes Once of I course understand it better so I want to thank you again, and I think I'm going to stop the live streaming right now. Okay. Yeah, thanks, everybody, for attending.